The Art of War is arguably one of the most influential books ever written, not just in Asian history, but in world history. The unifiers of Japan, Oda Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and Tokugawa Ieyasu were all influenced by the book. Ho Chi Minh translated it so his Vietnamese officers could read and learn from it. The American general, Douglas MacArthur, is quoted as saying that he always kept a copy of The Art of War on his desk. And it's even possible that the KGB studied the book's strategies on deception. Even outside of warfare, the art of war has been applied, mostly in business, politics, and management. But it has made its mark in areas you would never expect. In sports, for example, the NFL coach Bill Belichick, the holder of the most Super Bowl wins in history, has spoken several times about the book and its influence on him. Indeed, everywhere you look, you'll see the art of war, whether directly or indirectly, influencing people's actions and behaviours. But as influential and well-known as the art of war is, you probably know very little of its author, Sun Tzu. You may know that he was a Chinese general and philosopher, but think beyond that. Do you know anything else about him? When was he born? How many battles did he win? How many did he lose? Who did he serve? For someone who had a massive impact on history, most people know almost nothing about him. Well, today I'm going to see what I can uncover about this ancient general, and see if his actions in life were as influential as his book was after his death. As you may imagine, very little is known about Sun Tzu's early years. Although he wasn't called Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu is a title, meaning Master Sun. The name he was born with, and is referred to in historical sources, is Sun Wu. The exact year of his birth isn't known, but the more reliable earlier sources, uh, the records of the Grand Historian of China and the Spring and Autumn Annals, both say that he was a native of Qi, then an independent state where today's Shandong province roughly is. We can get a rough idea of when Sun Tzu was born, as he served King Helu of Wu, which would place Sun Tzu's birth in the latter years of the Spring and Autumn period. The Spring and Autumn period is dated between 770 BCE and 476 BCE, with Sun Tzu's traditional birth date being around 544. Almost nothing else of Sun Tzu's younger years is known, just a likely date and rough location, but he will re-emerge in history later in life. The interesting thing about Sun Tzu is that he seems to have already written The Art of War before he got any major experience with combat, so it's likely he was a renowned military theorist before he was a general. The Spring and Autumn Annals of Wu and Yu, an unofficial historical record, if an incredibly stylized one, is older than the records of the Grand Historian and tells us how King Helu heard of Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu, whose name was Wu, was a native of Wu. He excelled at military strategy, but dwelled in secrecy far away from civilization, so ordinary people did not know of his ability. Wu Zizu, King Helu's advisor, himself enlightened, wise, and skilled in discrimination, knew Sun Tzu could penetrate and destroy the enemy. One morning, when he was discussing military affairs, he recommended Sun Tzu seven times. King Helu said, since you have found an excuse to advance this Qi, I want to have him brought in. He questioned Sun Tzu about military strategy, and each time that he laid out a section of his book, the king could not praise him enough. One thing to keep in mind is that our sources on Sun Tzu are slightly contradictory. The passage I just read said that he was a native of Wu, but the record of the Grand Historian put him as a native of Qi. A small discrepancy in the big scheme of things, but something to keep in mind. But he would become a general. At an unknown date, King He Lu of Wu summoned Sun Tzu, then called Sun Wu, to his court to test his ability. The following story is taken from the records of the Grand Historian, and is one of the best known stories of Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu was a native of the Qi state. His art of war brought him to the notice of He Lu, King of Wu. He Lu said to him, I have carefully perused your 13 chapters. May I submit your theory of managing soldiers to a slight test? Sun Tzu replied, you may. Helu asked, may the test be applied to women? 
The answer was again in the affirmative, so arrangements were made to bring 180 ladies out of the palace. Sun Tzu divided them into two companies and placed one of the king's favourite concubines at the head of each. He then bade them all take spears in their hands and address them thus. I presume you know the difference between front and back, right hand and left hand. The girls replied yes. Sun Tzu went on. When I say eyes front, you must look straight ahead. When I say left turn, you must face towards your left hand. When I say right turn, you must face towards your right hand. When I say about turn, you must face right round towards your back. Again, the girls assented. The words of command having been thus explained, he set up the halberds and battle axes to begin the drill. Then, to the sound of drums, he gave the order right turn, but the girls only burst out laughing. Sun Tzu said, if words of command are not clear and distinct, if orders are not thoroughly understood, then the general is to blame. So he started drilling them again, and this time gave the order left turn, whereupon the girls once again burst into fits of laughter. Sun Tzu said, if words of command are not clear and distinct, if orders are not thoroughly understood, the general is to blame. But if his orders are clear, and the soldiers nevertheless disobey, then it is the fault of their officers. So saying, he ordered the leaders of the two companies to be beheaded. Now the King of Wu was watching the scene from the top of a raised pavilion, and when he saw that his favourite concubines were to be executed, he was greatly alarmed and hurriedly set down the following message. We are now quite satisfied as to our general's ability to handle troops. If we are bereft of these two concubines, our meat and drink will lose their savour. It is our wish that they shall not be beheaded. Sun Tzu replied, Having once received his majesty's commission through the general of his forces, there are certain commands of his majesty which, acting in that capacity, I am unable to accept. Accordingly, he had the two leaders beheaded, and straight away installed the pair next in order leaders in their place. When this had been done, the drum was sounded for the drill once more, and the girls went through all the evolutions, turning to the right or to the left, marching ahead or wheeling back, kneeling or standing with perfect accuracy and precision, not venturing to utter a sound. Then Sun Tzu sent a messenger to the king, saying, Your soldiers, sire, are now properly drilled and disciplined, and ready for your majesty's inspection. They can be put to any use that their sovereign may desire, bid them go through fire and water, and they will not disobey. But the king replied, Let our general cease drilling and return to the camp. As for us, we have no wish to come down and inspect the troops. Thereupon Sun Tzu said, The king's only fond of words, and cannot translate them into deeds. As you can imagine, Herr Lu quickly appointed Sun Tzu as his general and put him in charge of the armed forces. We're about to talk about Sun Tzu's military campaigns, but before we can do that, we need to talk about the state of China at the time. Because China, like in a lot of its history, is not in one piece. China was technically under the control of the Zhou dynasty, but over time the kings, the Chinese monarchs didn't yet call themselves emperors, had seen their power eroded by various vassals and viscounts as they achieved almost complete regional autonomy, to the point where they were able to declare wars against each other and defy the imperial court. At the time, the largest and most powerful states that were vying for power were the Chu in the south, Wu, where Sun Tzu currently is in the east, Qi in the northeast, Qin in the northwest, and Jin in the north, with other more minor states kind of all over the place. Wu and Chu had an ongoing rivalry even before Sun Tzu arrived on the scene. Over the last 70 years, the two states had fought 10 wars with each other. Wu had won most of them, but hadn't had a chance to launch any major offensives. That's about to change. In 506 BC, King He Lu and Sun Tzu made their move, launching massive offensives against their much larger and more powerful neighbour Chu. They won five battles, and we have details of one of them, the Battle of Boju, which we will have a look at in a minute. Wu wasn't alone in this fight though. The Chu was easily the largest of all the Chinese states, and they hadn't exactly made friends. Wu was joined by the minor states of Kai and Tang. Uh, their kings were currently being held hostage by the Chu, and they likely saw this as their chance to free them, or at least get revenge. Even with this support though, the allied force was small, numbering around 30,000 men. When Wu invaded, King He Lu led his army personally into battle, sailing his army up the Huai River, then marching to the east bank of the Han River. In response, the Chu army, led by Nang Hua and Chen Yin Shi, 
set up on the west bank of the river, opposite the invaders. They must have felt pretty good at their chances, as their army was between 200 to 300,000 men. How could the Wu defeat an army 6 to 10 times their size? But still, Shen Yunshu had a plan to drive off the invaders. His subordinate Nang Hua would take the main army and set up defensive positions on the Han River, while Shen would head north to Fangcheng, take the soldiers stationed there to destroy the Wu ships that had been left on the Huai River. In addition to this, he would also block the three passes that the Chu could take if they were to retreat. With the passages blocked and the ships destroyed, the two Chu forces would then attack the Wu from both sides. Easy, right? Now, you may be thinking to yourself that this is actually a really solid plan. It takes advantage of their numerical superiority, attacks the Wu from two fronts, and cuts off all their possible escape routes. What could go wrong? Well, after Shen left the main force, personal interest seems to have played a part. Nang Hua, who just had to hold his army in place until Shen was in place, was told by the historiographer Shi Huang that the people of Chu actually hated him, but they loved Shen. If they followed Chen's plan, then he would take all the credit and Nang Hua would receive none. Nang Hua, seeking glory and recognition, made the fateful decision to attack over the river immediately. There were three battles in the following days, with Wu coming out victorious and Nang Hua was considering retreating, but Shi Huang, the same guy who had told him that Shen would take all the credit and that he should attack early, convinced him to keep fighting. This would be the defining battle of the war. The two armies drove up Boju. Fugai, one of the two, one of the other Wu generals, asked King He Lu for permission to attack. His case being that Nang Hua was cruel, his soldiers lacked a will to fight, and that if attacked, they would quickly break and flee. Regardless, the king denied his request, but Fugai decided that the king's orders were more akin to suggestions, and that he should, and that he would attack anyway. This turned out to be a very good thing. His 5,000 men charged and shattered the larger Chu force, with Shi Huang, whose ideas had all been, being killed in the confusion and Nang Hua fled to Zheng, a minor Chinese state to the north. Fu Gai kept up the pressure on the now leadless army, chasing them, chasing them to the Qingfa River, where he let half of them cross the river before attacking again. Leaderless, morale at an all-time low, and their forces split by the river, they were defeated again and their retreat continued. This time they caught up to their army while they had sat down to eat. The Wu attacked, causing another rout. The Wu then ate the meals that had been prepared for the Chu before they um, before they continued following the fleeing army even further. They would catch them again at another river, the Sima River. As you can imagine, the Chu suffered another defeat. With the main Chu force killed, captured or fleeing, the Wu army quickly captured the enemy capital of Ying. Just to tie up some loose ends, you may want to know what happened to Shen, the general that had headed north to attempt a flanking maneuver on the Wu. Well, he had actually done a pretty good job. He had run into some enemy forces and fought a series of battles, but he actually won those. But he had also been wounded three times, and unwilling to be captured alive, he ordered an officer to kill him and take his head home. Now, with all this said, you may be thinking to yourself that this was supposed to be a video on Sun Tzu, but I haven't mentioned him anywhere in the account of the Battle of Boju. And this is where we must finally get into the matter of if Sun Tzu was actually a real person. Spoilers, it's complicated. The thing about Sun Tzu is that even though the record of the Grand Historian does place Sun Tzu as the leader of the Wu forces during their war with the Chu, and the Battle of Boju belongs to him, we do have a source much closer in time to the actual events of that war, and indeed Sun Tzu's lifetime. The Zhe Zhuan was written in the late 4th century BC, just a few decades after the Battle of Boju, which was recorded as happening in the year 5 or 6 BC. The thing is, the Zhe Zhuan does have an account of, of the Battle of Boju, and it doesn't mention Sun Tzu. 
In fact, it doesn't mention Sun Tzu at all anywhere. The record of the Grand Historian and the Spring and Autumn Annals of Wu and Yu are the first sources to mention Sun Tzu, and they were published hundreds of years after the Battle of Boju, and when Sun Tzu was supposed to have lived. But The Art of War is a real book, a good one as well, so who wrote it? There is a theory that the book was written about a hundred years later than it supposedly was, but we'll look at that potential author in a minute as it's a big theory. As for Sun Tzu, it's possible that name was just made up. What gives this away is the name the records of the Grand Historian give him, in that he's called Sun Wu, with Sun Tzu being a title meaning Master Sun. Sun Wu could be a cognomen, meaning the fugitive warrior. You see, the surname Sun can be translated as meaning fugitive, while Wu is the ancient Chinese virtue of martial or valiant. With such an interpretation, you could see Sun Wu easily being a metaphor and not an actual historical person in the story. But there is another, possibly more credible candidate for the position of Sun Tzu. Remember a couple minutes ago when I said that there's a theory that The Art of War was written a hundred years later than it supposedly was? Well, let's have a look at that. Sun Bin lived only about a hundred or so years after Sun Tzu is supposed to have died, and we know he was a real person. He was tutored in military strategy and served as a military strategist and commander in the Qi state. Yes, even a hundred years later, China still wasn't united. He led Qi to victory against their rival Wei in several battles, and he even authored his own book called, and you won't believe this, Sun Bin's Art of War. He seems like the perfect candidate, really. Sun Bin's Art of War and Sun Tzu's Art of War are actually incredibly similar to one another. The only major difference between the two is that Sun Bin's version gives strategies on how to deal with siege warfare, while Sun Tzu's versions argue against it. In fact, when Sun Bin's Art of War was rediscovered in 1972 in a tomb excavation, it was found with fragments of Sun Tzu's Art of War. I don't know about you, but personally I find this stuff quite compelling for Sun Bin to be the real author of The Art of War. He was an actual verifiable person with military experience and military victories, and he lived pretty close to when Sun Tzu was supposed to live. The only thing that really has to change is that The Art of War was written a hundred years later. But at the end of the day, we'll have to leave this mystery, unfortunately, unsolved. While I do find Sun Bin a very compelling figure to be the true author of The Art of War, there's no definitive proof. Sun Bin's Art of War could just be based on earlier work with improvements to reflect more up-to-date warfare, or he could be the true author and the Sun Tzu that appears in later sources could be a literary device and was never intended to be interpreted as an actual person, or The Art of War wasn't written by Sun Bin or Sun Tzu and its author was someone unknown. It could have even been a group of people whose teachings were pulled together to make the work. At the end of the day, you're just going to have to decide for yourself, as I doubt this is going to get answered anytime soon.